36-year-old city narcotics detective Marcellus Ward was shot and killed last night during an undercover drug deal police say went sour. Today, his alleged assailant, 26-year-old LaSalle Simmons, was charged with first-degree murder and ordered held without bail. A convicted drug dealer, Simmons was released from prison last year. After a hearing at the Southern Police District this morning, Simmons' family charged he had been beaten by police. He could scrap the officer who beat him in his face and kicked him in his face and everything in the cell last night. They beat him. He don't have no clothes on. They beat him. They beat him. They beat him. Minutes later, Simmons' mother collapsed. Please, somebody get somebody. She's half down. Get somebody. Elaine Simmons was taken to the coronary care unit at South Baltimore General Hospital, where tonight she is reported in stable condition. Another suspect in the case, 28-year-old Mark Byron Walker, has been charged with conspiracy to violate federal drug laws, and this afternoon was also ordered held without bail. Police headquarters today was draped in black, and flags were at half-mast. Police say they may never know the exact circumstances under which Detective Ward was killed. He was part of a Federal Drug Enforcement Administration task force and was making an undercover drug deal in an apartment on Frederick Avenue around 545 when fellow officers moved in to make the arrest. When the officers hit the door downstairs, they heard gunshots. Uh, they ran upstairs and encountered the suspect who fired a couple of shots, uh, slightly injuring a federal officer. Uh, he then retreated back into a room and after about 10 minutes was talked into throwing out the guns and he surrendered. It was at that point that we found Detective Ward uh, mortally wounded in, in the living room. Drug enforcement officials say Ward had purchased very high-grade heroin from the suspects three times before. The procedures used in this investigation are the types of procedures we use in hundreds of these investigations a year in the city, thousands across the country. Uh, the operational risk of injury to the officers is always there. Uh, we attempted to minimize these things. Uh, all of us in this business understand this, and this is one of those instances where it went wrong. A drug enforcement official today described Detective Ward as a leader in his field, someone who is respected by his peers. He spent most of his career trying to get drugs off the streets of Baltimore, the official said, and he paid the ultimate price for it. At police headquarters, Joan Gartland, New Scene 2. Graffiti like this has always posed a problem to communities trying to maintain attractive neighborhoods and parks. But now the city's anti-vandalism campaign has found a way to conquer this destruction with the aid of a new space-age solvent. It's called GP66, and what it does is make graffiti disappear. You know, someone puts it on with a spray gun, takes them about two seconds. It takes us to buy the material. It takes a lot of scrubbing. It takes quite a bit of money in order to remove the graffiti. And every time you spend that money, then that's less money you have to be able to perform for the community. Mm -hmm. Do you think this will discourage kids from writing on the walls? Yeah, if the community works with us. Mayor Schaefer said the locally produced cleaner is approved by the USDA and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And as you can see, it gets the job done. Neighborhoods throughout the city will be using GP66 to get vandals riding off the walls and restoring the charm of Baltimore to their communities. Kathy Bond, New Scene 2 in Reservoir Hill. John H. Murphy Sr. had the vision, that of starting a newspaper for and about blacks. The former slave turned out his first one-page religious weekly in 1892. Over the years, the weekly grew, and before long, the Baltimore Afro-American was born. The Afro became, and still is, the leading black newspaper around the country, and in some cases, internationally. Jake Oliver, the senior Murphy's great-grandson, is now vice chairman of the paper. I think the newspaper, um, because of the fact that it's uh, been around for 90 years, uh, is a good example of black survival uh, in business. Uh, it, it stands for the proposition that blacks can do something uh, well uh, for
for a continued period of time and make it profitable. The Afro now includes a magazine entitled Dawn, which can be found in most black papers throughout the nation. Circulations monthly amount to about one million. The Afro has been a forerunner on the civil rights front, claiming credit along with the NAACP for much of the city's desegregation efforts. Although through the years uh, the issues have changed as a result of, of, of government and the people becoming sensitive to blackness and the black experience, um, there are still many more issues uh, which are particularly going into the 80s and the 90s that uh, the Afro will be leading uh, and becoming very active in. On this, the 90th birthday celebration of the Afro-American newspapers, the hope is by its leaders is that it will be even more instrumental in making change in the community. Dolores Ramsey, News Scene 2 in Northwest Baltimore. This is what you'd see if you walk into the Pratt's downtown branch and look to your right. That wall tells visitors a major renovation is underway. The major point of, of renovation activity will occur um, on the north end and the south ends of the main floor. Uh, we are installing mezzanines on both ends of the building that will give us an additional 10,000 square footage of space. Mayor Schaefer and Lieutenant Governor Joe Curran were on hand for today's so-called groundbreaking ceremonies. But since there wasn't any ground to break, they helped to paint a huge mural that's been erected to block the ongoing construction from curious visitors. Most of the painting on the mural has already been done by students from a local art school, who also provided their own Tom Sawyer today to help with the paint brushes. But it'll take more than just paint to finish this job. The project will take about 15 months, which brings us to 1986, which um, we've timed with a great deal of, of, of orchestration because that is our centennial year. And we will be launching a number of, I hope, exciting activities uh, that the public can join in to celebrate the 100th year of the Pratt Library. We think it's so appropriate that we have a new face at that time. The mayor also hopes the library becomes a major tourist attraction in the months ahead to help lure some of those inner harbor visitors a little further to the north. Brenda Carl, New Scene 2 at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Members of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union say they hope a federal mediator will help head off a strike here. Yesterday, they rejected a three-year contract proposal from the Amstar Corporation, that's Domino's parent company. There hasn't been a strike here in 35 years, but union officials say this year could be different. That is, if the company doesn't change its position on a number of issues. Line of wages, we were not offered anything in the first year. Uh, there's a two-tier wage system that the company introduced, which would bring in uh, new employees at $3 an hour less, and we feel as though that has to be resolved before we can go uh, back and sign an agreement. Uh, we feel as though that's very serious. It's, a, it's an area where uh, it puts the current employees in jeopardy of losing their jobs. The workers also say the rejected proposal did not boost their pension payments enough. Local plan officials refused to discuss the negotiations with us. Joyce Jefferson, News Scene 2. All other teams in the National Football League play either at 1 or at 4. Since the Colts cannot play at 1, they sometimes play at 4 to get on network television. But they don't like it. Late in the season, a 4 o'clock game is a night game. And I, I just think it hurts our drawing ability because people don't like to go to games at 4 o'clock. And secondly, uh, it, there's a safety factor. It becomes a night game. When they do play at 2, the Colts don't get on network television. They don't like that either. You obviously want more exposure. If you're good, you like to have your players on television, and, and it does more for the stature of your franchise. And anything that helps the franchise helps the city. But people in the area near the stadium are opposed to moving up the starting time. They say a lot of fans arrive early and park on the streets and will interfere with people going to the many churches in the area. It creates a problem for the churches in our community because their uh, congregations which arrive for say a 10 or 11 o'clock service uh, either cannot park because fans arrive early or cannot leave the neighborhood because of incoming traffic. I do understand the problems out at the stadium, but you've got to remember that the people in that area out there, when we start talking about moving the stadium, they wanted the stadium left there. Uh, the businesses wanted the stadium left there, and uh, so we're over that. I see. I really don't see any harm. 
The decision on moving up the starting time goes first to city council, and if council approves, it goes before the city voters. Kevin Brown, you scene two at the Colts Complex. The Metro's been operating for 10 weeks now, carrying about 20,000 passengers a day. MTA projections were that today the one millionth passenger would pass through the turnstile. Since there was no exact way to calculate number one million, the MTA decided 437 was the witching hour, and at random determined the winner would be the tenth person to pass through gate number 18. It's this man right here. You are the one millionth rider. You're kidding. On the Baltimore subway. You're I'm Dave Wagner, the MTA administrator. You're kidding me, I'm sure. You have a six-month pass, free pass, on the Baltimore Metro. We have representatives from Thomas Cook and British Airways that will award you a free five-day paid vacation in London for two. <laughs> The winner is 44-year-old Dennis O'Brien. He's an auditor for BG&E. He lives in Overly and usually takes the bus home. So why was he going to the Reisterstown station today? My wife called me up. She says, go down and buy a ticket on the subway. We had, had driven on it one time over to Howard. He said, I said, fine, all right. I said, why? She said, because the one millionth passenger. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh. So I said, all right, I'll do it. Well, a lot of you men complain that sometimes your wives tell you what to do. I guess the moral to this story is sometimes you should listen. Joyce Jefferson, New Scene 2 at the Charles Center Station. There is a wealth of black artistic talent in the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland. Singers, dancers, musicians, artists, enriching all of our lives. But there are two very special people here at Baltimore's High School for Performing Arts who are not only talented, but have the drive and desire to pass on their crafts to young people. All right, here we go. Sylvester Campbell has danced on prestigious stages throughout the world, from Moscow to New York. He was a member of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet and the Maryland Ballet. And yet, when he was asked to head up the dance department at Baltimore's High School for Performing Arts, he took the job with little hesitation or soul-searching. Well, it's just that I thought it was time to, you know, give my services to younger people and to help them on with what they want to accomplish. There's nothing like, you know, giving a class to uh, uh, your students and seeing something happen. It's like seeing something grow, you know, seeing a plant grow or something like that. Might, you might want to describe it that way. But uh, it's so enriching. I mean, it's, so, it's, it's, it's such a uh, thankful thing. I think it's more exciting than being on the stage, really. Anybody have a piece that they did from the exam that they would like to put up? Upstairs at the High School for Performing Arts is the art class of Carol Bayard. She's considered one of this country's top illustrators of children's books, primarily books about black history, culture, and family life. Her pictures are lifelike and filled with Carol's personal pride in being black. It has been, uh, I guess, my feeling that the best way that I can portray black people is realistically, uh, for children especially, and uh, with a lot of love and understanding in terms of, of my background and my home life and my family and friends. And that's what I try to put into the book. Like Sylvester Campbell, Carol Bayard feels the need to teach, even if it means paying less attention to her own art career. The students at Baltimore's High School for Performing Arts are lucky indeed to have the talent and sincere dedication of teachers like these. I'm Susan White Bowden, New Scene 2. Twenty-year-old Rolette Boone of Baltimore makes regular visits to the University of Maryland Hospital. She is single and pregnant. Her baby is due any day now. Rolette is getting help during this period of her life from the University of Maryland Hospital's pre-pregnancy program. Most of the expected mothers who come here are from the inner city, unmarried, often poor, and many of them are teenagers. Because they are unable to provide themselves with proper nutrition and prenatal care, they run a greater risk of losing their babies. A teenager is still growing and developing so that they have a certain requirement for their own needs versus an adult woman who's pregnant 
who is already fully developed. So that a teenager needs, for instance, a lot of extra food just for herself, let alone a, a growing baby. They are more likely to deliver prematurely. Premature babies often do not survive. While teenage and poor mothers run the greater risk of losing their babies, doctors emphasize that mothers in all socioeconomic groups must be wary. Baltimore's infant mortality rate is significantly higher than the national rate. Nationwide, about 11 of every 1,000 newborns die. In Baltimore, the number is 17 of every 1,000. One major factor in that rate is the number of teenage mothers. And the head of the city health department told me teenage pregnancy in Baltimore is an epidemic. They're in trouble because they're young and they're going to be faced with the care of at least one child, frequently more than that, before they're out of their teens. And there is another factor, strong evidence to support the link between infant deaths and economics. The three city areas with the highest infant mortality rates are East Baltimore, West Baltimore, and Lower Park Heights. They contain a high concentration of the city's poor. Rolette Boone isn't aware of all the facts and figures, but she is aware of the need to care for herself, aware of what happened to other young mothers. Well, I know a couple of girls who waited a long time before they went to the clinic, like in their sixth and seventh months. And then they go in and they have problems, you know, where the baby didn't turn right, so then they need cesareans and stuff like that. Or they're not eating right, or a lot of them drink, or a lot of them indulge in drugs. Rolette Boone is getting assistance with her health care and nutrition costs from the federal program called WIC, Women, Infants, and Children. There are a number of patients who, because they don't have funding uh, and are concerned about being turned away from the hospital, um, not perhaps aware of what's available to them through uh, various uh, third-party pay uh, uh, programs, such as medical assistance, uh, the extended maternity plan through the state health department, and so on, um, who stay home and who don't obtain prenatal care, perhaps until it's too late. This is Baltimore's waterfront at Fells Point, an area it seems destined for development. From here at the foot of Broadway to Clinton Street to the east, a plan is in the works. As city officials described it tonight at a meeting of a preservation group, the plan would eventually mean condominiums, townhouses, and marinas for as many as a thousand boats. But there could be problems. The plans are great. They really sound great, but I foresee one great problem, and that's parking. Plans are great. I just wonder whether they'll ever develop and uh, whether the, uh, there's enough demand to uh, fill all the condominiums, apartments, boat slips, and that sort of thing. There is some concern about development driving up property taxes. To some, development means progress. We can't, uh, we can't stop the clock. It's not good for us. Nevertheless, that has to be done with the, with the people in mind who live here now. The kind of progress they're talking about tonight, however, could be 10 years down the road. Brad Ganson reporting for Nightside. Yeah. Snatchings occurred in the Rogers Forge area of Towson. Early Saturday night, within a period of about 20 minutes, three women were robbed on the streets here. One of them was hit over the head. I'm very grateful to be alive. I... Reporter Mike Ritz talked to one of the victims who was afraid if her face appeared on camera, her assailant may come back to attack her again. I'm so angry. I mean, this is in front of my own home, you know, not three or four doors down. And I felt safe there and protected. And I'm not real sure I feel safe there anymore. Police said today three of the victims were able to identify their assailants through police photographs, enabling them to make two arrests. We arrested two young men, both juveniles, uh, 116, 117, and they've been charged with the Saturday night uh, mugging type robberies of two Rogers Forge uh, area women. Police identified the suspects as 16-year-old Robert Wesley Futrell of Towson. He has been charged with two of the muggings in Rogers Forge and an earlier one in Parkville. He is being held on $40,000 bail. The other suspect, Leon Warren Mitchell III, a student at Northern High School, was charged with two of the Rogers Forge muggings. He was released this afternoon on $1,000 bail. County police are continuing their investigation into the rash of muggings in the Towson Parkville area. They say the two suspects may be connected with all 16 robberies. Joan Gartland, New Scene 2, Towson.